good morning or evening or whatever it is where you are. Um, so I'm Arthur O'Dwyer, and I'm going to be giving you, yeah, as he said, uh, two talks. The first talk that I wanted to give, a, a very simple uh, little lightning talk, well, not that simple. Um, but when I was at, it was CPPCon last year, and Rene Rivera gave this lightning talk. By the way, if you've already seen this on YouTube, I put a version on YouTube on Monday. Um, so this will be the same thing. Um, but Rene Rivera gave a talk at CPPCon 2019 uh, where it was billed as a uh, C++ magic trick, basically, that, that he had a, a physical deck of cards uh, that he had had made and, and some uh, C++ code and walked through uh, both of those at the same time and you know with a volunteer from the audience and, and so on. And he managed to to figure out the volunteer's card by a series of uh, shuffles and, and sorts. Um, and I looked at that and thought, well, that's pretty cool. I think I want to do something like that. And so I had worked up a lightning talk for C++ Now 2020, uh, which was actually going to be this week uh, in Aspen, Colorado. And because of the coronavirus, we didn't do a C++ Now conference. And so I had nowhere to do this talk. Uh, and so when this group said, do you want to come on and, and uh, give a talk at our virtual meetup? I said, yeah. And, and in fact, I have a lightning talk. Um, so this lightning talk is a card trick. And uh, I believe you, be, you can see that I have some C++ code uh, in my screen share that I think everyone can see at the moment. Uh, I hope so. And also here at home, I have a deck of cards, a regular old shuffled deck of cards. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask, I can't ask for a volunteer from the audience, but I think we're going to take a poll. No, no screen share. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah, this stopped sharing. Let me, uh, something went wrong. Please ensure you're connected to the internet. OK, let's try this again. Say try again. Hmm. Well, if that happens up here, I'm going to be screwed. So um, OK. Andreas, I'm um, backstage. There we go. Oh, except. There, try that one more time. All right. All right, so here we have some code. We have some C++ code uh, in Compiler Explorer. And if you want to get a copy of this code so you can play along at home, uh, the easiest way to do that is probably uh, to Google uh, C++ Now 2020, C++ Magic Trick, click on the YouTube video, look in the summary like of the YouTube video. There's a link to this gun bolt. Um, all right. Uh, so here we have some C++ code. And here I have a deck of cards. And I'm going to take this deck of cards. I'm going to try to point the camera more at the cards here. And I'm going to shuffle them up. And I'm going to pull out the last three cards from the deck, from the back of the deck here. Uh, one, two, three from the. Uh, the back of the deck. And in the Godbolt, we have uh, a string, uh, char a rec bracket. This magic trick uses namespace std, the last three characters of that string being std. Right? So I have std, and d is the last character, std. Right. So uh, I would like you to pick uh, a uh, pick a number between one and three, one, two, or three which correspond to the S, the T, and the D in that string. And in the Godbolt, where it says your card, right now there's a question mark. And I'm going to put in uh, whatever card you pick. So uh, yeah, one is the card at the very back. Um, so Andreas or, or someone, tell me which one to pick. I'm looking at the, the live comments. And it's not helping, because of course everyone's showing different things. Do we have a poll? So we don't have a poll, unfortunately, but uh, people are happily voting. Um, I yeah, see a lot I of twos. I, I think it's the yeah. two, actually. Yeah. Let's do, let's do two. All right. So here's the, the, the six of clubs here. So that corresponds to the T in STD, right? the middle of those three cards. And I'll uncomment this code. I'll go a bit down here. All right. And I squared up the deck again. Hopefully, it didn't leave the camera. You know, I don't have anything up my sleeves. Um, 
Okay, now so I'm uh, see outing here the number of cards down from the top it is. It is two down from the top. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to mutate the order of this deck. I'm going to use one of these mutating STL algorithms uh, to permute the order of the cards in the deck, the order of the characters in the array. So uh, you said card number two, right? which was the six of clubs. So what I'm going to do is two times, n cards number of times, I'm going to take the top card of the deck and insert it somewhere random in the middle of the deck, which if you've watched Connor's talk, you know that's a rotate. And I'm going to do it a second time. Second card off the top of the deck. Buried somewhere in the middle. So your card is now buried somewhere in the middle of this deck. Right? So now that your card has been buried, now I have to get it out. Right? That, that's the point. Right? Is this your card? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to uh, square the deck up here. And I am going to attempt to make your card rise out of the deck. I'm going to attempt to make your card come out higher than any other card in the deck. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to rub it with my finger, and I'm going to build up some, some static electricity, some static magnetism here, and I'm going to try to draw your card upward, sticking to my finger, out of the deck. That's your card. Applause break. Uh, no, but how do we do that in C++? One well, C++, I wanted to make your card become higher than all the rest. How do we find the highest element uh, using the STL? Of course, we use the max algorithm here. So the max algorithm from uh, SV begin to SV end, that will give me an iterator. I dereference that iterator with star. And I'm going to ask, is this your card T, the, se the second card down from STD? Going to wait for Godbolt to run the code. and. Is that your character? T. And there you go. That's the trick. So uh, you, you can work out uh, how I did that uh, in real life, and you can work out how I did that in C++. It's two tricks for the price of one. So that, that was my little C++ magic trick. Lightning talk. All right. So uh, with that, uh, Andreas, if we can, oh, yes, I need to switch over which tab I'm presenting, which will then kick me out of the room, and we'll, we'll do this again. Uh, yeah, we will get you back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think people like the trick. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> All right. So I think there's your slides. All right. So let's talk about something different. Let's talk about return value optimization and uh, return x, everything there is to talk about with return x. Um, so this is an expanded version of a talk that I gave uh, at CPPCon, I want to say 2018, um, where I had uh, at that time just completed a Clang patch. And it was going to be sort of a, a two-part talk first about um, what the problem was the patch was solving, and then about the patch. Um, but when I submitted it, I thought I could do it in 30 minutes, and I kind of forgot uh, that I had said that. And so I got up on stage thinking I had 60 minutes to do this talk, and I actually had 30. And so it was kind of a rush talk at that point, and I figured, well, I'll take 90 minutes at C++ Now and, and do it right. And uh, of course, C++ Now didn't happen, so here I am. And so this talk might go 90 minutes. I hope it doesn't. I hope I can speed through it and you know, a little over 60, but we'll see. Um, and so this is not going to be so much about the patch as about everything there is to know about return x. Um, and indeed, I am going to switch these comments off for now. All right. All right. Um, so everything you need to know about return x. So here's the stuff that you need to know. Uh, number one, I'm going to show some uh, code gen, some uh, C++ in the assembly that corresponds to it. And we're going to talk about what is the return slot at all. Uh, like, how is it physically laid out in memory? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about copy elision, what it is, and what is now guaranteed in C++ uh, 17. Uh, I'm going to present rules of thumb, uh, which are 
all you needed to know, all you need to know, really, the things I used to say and not feel at all bad about it. And then I'm going to show some ways in which what I used to say, what I still say, has some flaws. There are some corner cases, some loopholes um, where the rule of thumb doesn't apply. I'm going to show two of those uh, in this section titled War Stories. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my Clang diagnostic. I'm going to tell you what's new in C20, a uh, couple of things, and also a little bit of a look forward to what is almost guaranteed to be in C23. All of this relating to what does it mean when we write return x? Just returning a simple x. So let's start with a very, very simple function. So here we have some C++ code for a function. Um, I have a uh, callee named apple that returns an int with value 42. And I have a caller uh, pair that contains the call to apple. Because anytime I'm talking about the calling convention or what does it mean to call a function, I need to have both. Right? I need to have the site where the call actually happens and then the, the, uh, the function that is being called, the callee. So the caller is the one who calls. The callee is the one who gets called. All right, so if you feed this to a C++ compiler uh, and you turn off inlining, uh, you will get something like this next slide. Here we are with, with no optimizations. Uh, I've turned off the frame pointer just to make the code gen a little bit simpler. Uh, and I'm printing out the assembly here. And we see that on x86.64, the function's uh, return value, if I'm returning a very simple, small, trivially copyable type like an int, uh, it goes into the uh, AX register. Also, EAX, RAX, whatever, it goes in the A register. Um, so this 42 gets moved into the EAX register, uh, and then I return from the function. And my call er uh, calls Apple and then looks at EAX to figure out um, what Apple returned. So as we step through this function, um, so here I have my instruction pointer, which uh, x86 calls EIP right here. This is the instruction pointer. Uh, it starts at the site of the call. And what a call does is push a return address onto the stack uh, and jump to that address. Uh, then we do another call, push another return address onto the stack, jump to Apple. Apple then puts 42 into EAX and returns. Return pops a return address off uh, and goes there. So the return address on the stack is 17 OB. So we pop that off and jump there. Uh, add one to EAX, so EAX currently has 42. Uh, now it has 43. We return again, so we pop and, and jump there. And now we're right back where we started, right? This is the magic of a call stack. The, this is actually a pretty cool idea they came up with somewhere back in the mists of time, I'm gonna guess 1940s or 50s, um, that we can have this single call instruction whose effect is, look, we, we sort of executed the call instruction and then we went on to the next line, uh, and we're just magically right back where we started. Our stack pointer's in the same place. Our instruction pointer is one line further on. Everything is the same, except that our EAX, our return value, has magically been populated with 43. Right? So that's really cool, actually. That's the magic of a call stack, the idea that this call instruction can sort of expand out into a whole bunch of other stuff on the stack and then get cleaned up, and we're right back where we started with the correct uh, return value. Um, but what do we do if we have a big object, an object that cannot fit into that single return register, EAX? Uh, if I have a fruit here that contains five ints, uh, five times four is 20 bytes of stuff in a fruit, and 20 bytes is too big to fit into uh, EAX, um, which is a eight byte register, right? Yes. Um, so I can't return a fruit in a EAX. So what does the calling convention do in this case? Uh, and again, I'm specifically looking at x86.64 um, for this entire talk. Um, but other platforms will do similar things because it's pretty much the only way you can do things, right? Um, they have different names for their registers and so on, but it's, it's basically the same convention. And this convention is that when we have a big object, the compiler is going to add to the calling convention for Apple, one hidden function parameter. Apple right now says, I take no parameters. But in fact, uh, when we generate code for it, that code is going to expect a parameter uh, passed in the first parameter register, our DI, 
for historical reasons. Um, and that parameter is going to be a pointer to what's called the return slot. Uh, the return slot is going to be space somewhere allocated by the caller uh, that is big enough to store the fruit in. So 20, a 20 byte landing pad somewhere that uh, we can put our result into. And so that's what we're doing here. We're uh, uh, putting one, two, three, four, five into the thing pointed to by RDI, by that hidden parameter. Um, and I can walk through this. The first thing the caller does is subtract from SP, the, the stack pointer, subtract a certain amount that is at least big enough to hold a fruit. Uh, we keep the stack aligned to an uh, eight bytes, so it's 24 bytes instead of 20, but whatever. Um, so we subtract from RSP, we move the address of that return slot into RDI, and then we call Apple. Apple then, uh, puts its result right there into the return slot that was provided by the caller and returns. And now we're right back where we started. This is the magic of a call stack. Uh, EIP is one past the call instruction. And that return slot that we created has now been correctly populated with one, two, three, four, five. Um, so we, the person who called Apple, the caller, uh, told Apple where to write its output. Apple doesn't get to decide where its return slot lives. Its return slot is provided by the caller. Apple's job is just to fill it in. Right? The caller owns the return slot and is responsible for cleaning it up, both uh, both in the call the destructor C++ sense and in the physical like pop the stack sense. So there are situations uh, like the one shown on this slide where uh, if we have a function uh, apples and oranges that can return either X or Y, depending on some condition. It needs to create X, create Y as local variables. And then based on some condition, it's going to move either X or Y into the uh, return slot. And it's going to, in this case, use the, uh, the move constructor to, to do so. Um, so here's how this would look laid out um, schematically in the stack. Um, the caller would provide a return slot big enough to hold a fruit, and then they would call the function that pushes a return address onto the stack. The function then is going to use the stack for its local variables x and y. It's going to have fruit x on the stack, and it's going to have fruit y on the stack. Uh, and then, based on the condition, it's going to decide which of these two gets move constructed up into the return slot before x and y are both destroyed and the stack is popped. So here we're, we're doing a move construct into this return slot. Um, I'm going to pause here and just take a quick peek over at the live comments to see if any questions have come in that are interesting. And the answer is no. The last live comment there was uh, feel free to ask questions. Good. Um, all right. So that's the return slot. And that's an example of a function that moves uh, a local variable into the return slot. But C++ actually gives us uh, this cool optimization called copy elision. If I have a function that returns nothing but apples, that is to say, nothing but x. So here I have a, uh, do I have a slide for this? Yes. So um, I have a local variable x of type fruit, and I'm returning a fruit. So I have a return slot provided by my caller of type fruit. Uh, I could do this. I could construct my local variable x, and then I could move it or copy it or whatever, You know, somehow get this fruit into the return slot. Um, but actually, I can do better. Right? This generates a lot of code because I have to first initialize x with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then move it into the return slot and, and finally pop the stack. Um, I can do better than this. The way I'm going to do better than this is I'm going to coalesce the uh, physical location of fruit x with the return slot that was provided by my caller. I'm actually going to say that the return slot is also where x is. So uh, here in this slot provided by my caller, I am going to say that's where x lives. right? I, as the function, as the callee, nothing but apples, x is my local variable. I control its lifetime. I get to pick where it lives. Normally, I pick that it lives somewhere down on the stack, and I allocate space for it. But I've already got this space provided by my caller. And I can just say, you know what? Since I'm going to return x anyway, x just actually lives there. 
And that means all I have to do is initialize it with one, two, three, four, five, and then return. I don't have to make a copy of it because it's already in the right place. This is observable right, in, in a couple of ways. Um, not only for uh, non-trivially copyable things because uh, you can observe whether the copy constructor is called or not, um, but you can even observe uh, with only a modicum of undefined behavior uh, that if I take the address of fruit x inside this function, uh, and then I take the address of the variable uh, corresponding to the return slot outside, uh, they will actually have the same address. X and Y have the same address uh, in this example, uh, assuming that copy elision takes place. And you can rely on copy elision taking place on all modern compilers. Um, it, it is technically not guaranteed that we will have copy elision happening right here on return X, um, but all modern compilers do it. And you know, if you're worried about should I rely on it or not, the answer is yeah, you, you can rely on it. Um, everyone does it. So in C++ 03 through 14, copy elision was permitted in many circumstances, uh, which we'll discuss as, as the bulk of this talk. Um, in C++ 17, uh, there are some places where something called uh, guaranteed copy elision or mandatory copy elision uh, takes place. And I'm going to attempt to explain uh, what that means, um, even though that turns out to not exactly be related to the subject of this talk, which was return x. Uh, return X is actually a case where a guaranteed copy elision doesn't take place, but I'll try to explain what it is. Um, but before we get there, there are some cases where this copy elision optimization is not possible. So when can't we elide? When can't we elide that copy? Well, here I have a function apples to apples that takes a fruit X as a parameter and then returns that same x. So I've got the syntactic form return x semicolon right here. That's the same form that gave us copy elision uh, in the previous example. But here, the thing that I am trying to return uh, is a parameter. So it was created by my caller. My caller uh, constructs the, or allocates space for the return slot and then they push some parameters and they push i and x and j so that i as, and, and then the return slot, so that i as the function apples to apples, as the call e, uh, I see i, x, and j on the stack. Um, and unfortunately, x lives right here. I didn't control where it was created. Uh, so I cannot possibly uh, have it share space with the return slot because I didn't create either of them. I don't control x's lifetime uh, and therefore I don't get to pick where it is allocated. We can't elide the copy because we don't control X's physical location. So we have to physically get the data from X into the return slot. That's going to require some instructions, no matter what. Uh, here's the reductio ad absurdum of this case. Uh, if I have a function that does return X, can that do copy elision? Well, not if X is a global variable. <laughs> right? Obviously, this is going to have to make a copy of, of the global variable. It certainly cannot. Uh, finagle things so that x is allocated in the same place as the return slot. Right. So we can't elide this copy either because we don't control x's physical location. x is physically here in memory. The return slot is physically here. We have to do something to get the bits from one place to the other. We can't use copy elision for that. Uh, I'm going to pause here and ask if there are any questions explicitly, just in case anyone is holding back in the live comments. Um, Ukulele asks, is copy elision possible in nested calls? Um, short answer, yes. Uh, and in fact, as of 17, guaranteed. Um, uh, we will probably see more about that. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's go on. So when else can't we elide? Um, here's a case where I have. Uh, my apples and oranges function again. We saw this earlier, right? And I've rewritten it so that instead of doing return some complicated expression, I now have an if, and I say if uh, some condition return x, otherwise return y. In this case, uh, in order to evaluate this condition, I have to have constructed both x and y. Um, 
but which one of them wants to be in the return slot depends on uh, which way this this condition evaluates, which I don't know before I've constructed them. So we have sort of a, a dependency here. I must construct them somewhere before I know which of them needs to go in the return slot. Uh, and therefore, I, I shouldn't construct either of them in the return slot. I need to construct them both somewhere else. And then I have to move one of them into the return slot. So there is actually standard ease for this. Uh, this is something I didn't know um, before uh, starting work on this version of this talk. The standard does have a concept of potential scope, um, which is somehow different from actual scope. Um, it ignores variable shadowing, I guess. Um, where here, we have two different returns here, return x and return y, both inside the potential scope of both of these variables. And so uh, that essentially means that uh, copy elision is not going to be possible in that case. We will see in the very last slides of this talk a little bit more about potential scope. Um, here's another example. This, this turns out to be an important example for people writing standard ease wording. Um, we can't elide if uh, there is no return slot, right? Copy elision means that we are allocating an object, uh, a local variable in the same place as the return slot. Uh, but if I have a function like Reggie here that returns a simple int, that is small and trivially copyable and therefore it is returned by value in a register, uh, it, there is no return slot. Um, and I cannot possibly have the address of this int x be the same as the address of this y in main. Right? If they were both fruits, I could do that. Uh, but if they're both ints, because of the calling convention for functions that return int, uh, copy elision is just physically not possible, not even meaningful in this example. So I will have two different objects, x and y, with different addresses. And there's one more important case. Uh, this was the main case that I talked about uh, in 2018 because this is what's going to motivate the uh, the Clang patch we're going to talk about. Uh, how many people know what this is? Waits for answers, doesn't get any because we're online. This is a durian, a durian fruit. A durian is a kind of fruit. Uh, it's, a, it's an Asian fruit. Um, and the thing about it, it, it's just like any other fruit, but it also has a, a smell has a double smell. Uh, it smells really bad. And here I have a function called slapchop that returns a fruit. It creates a local variable of type durian, and it returns that durian. That's OK, right? Because a durian is a fruit. So it is OK to return a durian from a function that says I return a fruit. But when I do so, I'm going to have to slice it. I'm going to have to take the whole big durian object, that 32 bit, 32 byte durian object, and slice it down to just the fruit part without the smell before I can return it from the function. That means the function's return slot, right, the, the caller doesn't know anything about durians. The caller allocated space for fruit, which is 20 bytes. Um, so we only have a 20 byte return slot, 20 byte landing pad for our return value. Um, a durian itself is bigger than that, cannot possibly fit into that slot. Therefore, copy elision um, cannot possibly happen here. Physically, it can't happen. Um, pause, go back to live comments, all sorts of stuff. All right. Um, whoops. Right. So, this is an example of somewhere uh, where we would have liked copy elision to take place, but physically, just physically, it cannot take place. But we can do something here, and we're going to see what that is. Um, but as long as we're talking about copy elision, let me talk a little bit about um, guaranteed copy elision. So C17 um, gave us this, uh, this feature called guaranteed copy elision, which I'm going to abbreviate GCE here. Um, uh, this is also known as deferred temporary materialization. I think uh, Cy Brand came up with that uh, that slogan, and, and I like that, deferred temporary materialization. What it means is that if I have a PR value, uh, a, uh, an R value that is, that is um, an object, not an R value reference, but like the return from pick would be a PR value. It's an actual fruit object. Um, and then I do something with that result, such as uh, initialize a local variable with it, 
or initialize a parameter variable with it. Right. In both of these cases, in both of these columns here, in the first column, I'm initializing a local variable fruit x with the result of pick. In the second place, I'm initializing the parameter variable fruit x with the result of pick. So in those scenarios, uh, C++ 98, like all the way back to the beginning, we have permitted copy elision to take place. C++ 17 actually rewrote the whole uh, rules around what is a PR value uh, to express that copy elision is guaranteed in this case. A PR value now in 17 and, and still in 20 um, is essentially a recipe for creating an object. It's not the object itself. It's just a recipe for getting a fruit. Uh, and the caller gets to decide exactly where that fruit is going to live, um, which they always have, right? This is just bringing C++ up to speed with the, uh, the calling conventions of popular platforms. So when X is initialized with a PR value, C++17 guarantees that the result of pick will have the same address as X. So in C++17 and later, there is no such thing as moving from pick's return slot into X. Uh, it is guaranteed that the return slot will be X. Um, now this applies only when you're doing stuff with PR values, pure R values, such as uh, the return value of pick. Um, what we were doing earlier with return x, right? The subject of this talk is everything you want to know about return x. X there is not a PR value. By definition, it's a variable. It's an L value. It has an address and everything. So uh, in a sense, this is not exactly copy elision. This is something else. Um, but it's called guaranteed copy elision. Um, so that was uh, why I said that uh, in Ukulele's question about uh, if I say return pick, uh, is it guaranteed to have copy elision there? And the answer is yes. Um, as of 17, that's guaranteed. Um, and it would always happen anyway, even before 17. Uh, so the rules for copy elision on PR values do stack with the rules for copy elision and return. So uh, here I have a function where I call pick. And uh, let's see, we're going to walk through this, right? I call pick. That creates a, a fruit object. Um, I then call eat with the result of that fruit. And we can walk through this where uh, in my caller, I create a return slot. Uh, and I'm going to create that return slot actually in the correct place on the stack for it to also be the first parameter to the eat function. I know as the caller, I know I'm going to call the eat function. I know I need to get its parameters on the stack in certain places. So when it comes time to put its first parameter on the stack, I want to make sure that that is exactly where I told pick to put its return value. So I'm going to tell it to put the return value right here. I'm going to load that up into RDI. I'm going to call pick. Pick populates that with uh, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, and then pick returns. Uh, then I load RDI back up with the uh, that same place on the stack. Um, this is now RDI is holding the first parameter to eat. It's holding now the address of that fruit y. And I'm going to call eat. And now we're inside eat. It expects to find its parameter y at exactly this address. That is exactly the same place that the caller put the return slot of pick, and the same place that pick put its local variable x, because inside pick, uh, we had copy elision taking place. So the address of the x inside pick and the y inside eat are actually going to be the same place. So that's cool. And so this is something that compilers would always do for you know at least since the mid 2000s. Um, they'd always uh, do this optimization. Um, but as of C++ 17, uh, at least the copy elision from the return slot of pick into fruit y is guaranteed that there will not be a move or a copy there, that that will be copy elided. Uh, the copy elision here. Um, uh, copy aligning the uh, the local variable x into the return slot. That's not necessarily guaranteed, but every compiler will do it. Right. So even in C++ 17, even with PR values, uh, there is a case where we can't do copy elision, uh, which is very similar to our durian fruit example from earlier. Uh, this is like crazy arcane stuff that, that you're going to make your eyes maybe glaze over or at least your brain freeze up. 
Um, that's okay. Um, this talk is a lot of that. I like that stuff. Um, but just to show you, there are still corner cases and loopholes, even in the guaranteed stuff. Um, here is an example that uses guaranteed copy elision yet does not copy elide. What's happening here? Um, I have a struct VB. And I'm going to make VB a virtual base of this struct A. So an A is has a virtual sub-object VB inside itself. Um, and A is move constructible. And I'm going to have a struct B that inherits from A. So a B ha has within itself an A, which has within itself a virtual base of uh, VB. And in the constructor for B, uh, I am going to uh, construct the virtual base first, right? get, get all my virtual bases out of the way, and then I'm going to construct my direct base A. And when I construct my direct base A, I'm going to construct it with the result of calling F, which returns an A. So the result of F is a PR value. Uh, it is a pure R value. It's not a reference to another object. It's an actual C++17 recipe for creating an A. The problem is it's a recipe for creating a complete A object. Um, and when I initialize my base here, I'm trying to initialize a, uh, an incomplete uh, A base class subobject, which doesn't involve the virtual bases. It's just the, the non-virtual base part of an A. Um, so this is exactly analogous to our durian fruit example. F effectively returns a durian, a complete A object, but the object that I want to pass as my return slot here to do copy elision, this A is actually uh, a base subobject, so it's smaller. It doesn't have the virtual part. Um, so unfortunately, we cannot actually do uh, copy elision in this case. Um, at least we can't if VB is non-empty, right? If VB has like an int inside it or something. If VB is empty, then actually GCC, MSVC, and ICC, according to, to Godbolt Compiler Explorer, all of those will actually do copy elision, even in this trivial case where VB is empty. That's actually pretty cool. Um, I feel like maybe that's a bug. I don't know. Um, Clang refuses to try it all, even when VB is empty. So anyway, so we do still have some corner cases where C++ 17's guaranteed copy elision uh, cannot be applied for physical reasons, right? just like our durian fruit example. Um, all right. So here is what I tell people when they ask about return value optimization. First of all, there are two kinds of return value optimization, and I don't like to conflate them. Or at least I know them to each have their own name. They are both types of RVO, but we have two types of RVO. First, there is URVO, unnamed return value optimization, where when you are returning a return value that doesn't have a name at all, it's a temporary, it's a PR value. In that case, you get copy elision. This fruit will be constructed directly in the uh, return slot. This uh, result of my helper function, its return slot will be my return slot as long as that's physically possible. This is guaranteed in C++ 17 as long as it's physically possible. Um, named RVO is the thing that is not yet guaranteed. Uh, and that's when I just say return x, or return some local variable by name. Uh, by the way, I can put parentheses around it if I want, but I can't do anything like return like a cast of a variable or a return std move of a variable, right? Those, those are not returning by name. I just want to say return, maybe some parens, x. When I do that, uh, I get copy elision um, pretty much all the time, except in the corner cases we've covered where either it's not physically possible uh, or if I have very complicated control flow such that uh, maybe the compiler thinks I'm in the apples or oranges case. Um, but basically all the time, if I have a simple function that returns a local variable by name, return x, I get copy elision. And even in those cases where I can't get copy elision for physical reasons, uh, there's something else that happens called implicit move. Implicit move means that when I return a local variable by name and I don't get copy elision for some physical uh, reason prevents me from getting copy elision, um, then X will still be implicitly moved from. It will actually, the, the overload resolution in the compiler will actually treat the name X as an R value. Here I have a function std string identity that takes an X 
by value. So I have a parameter x. Since this is a parameter, I physically cannot uh, put it in the return slot because I don't control where it lives, right? My caller controls where x lives. My caller controls the return slot. I cannot unilaterally decide that x lives in the return slot. So I can't do copy elision here. But I just say return x, and x will be implicitly moved from. Right? It, will, it will not be copied. Um, and this came in in C++11, and because of the implicit move feature, writing return std move of x is almost always a pessimization. It never helps you. Rule of thumb, it never helps you. And it might hurt you if you write return std move of x instead of return x, because return x might do copy elision. It might do named return value optimization. So you might actually get no copy or move. If you write return std move of x, you always definitely get a move. Um, and so uh, writing the explicit std move is actually often a pessimization. The rule of thumb that I used to tell people and think I was telling the truth, and now I tell people, and now I'm lying a little bit, but this is still the rule of thumb. Don't write return std move of x. Just write return x. That will get you copy elision whenever it's possible. And uh, even if it's not possible, it will do implicit move, and it will move instead of copy, because it knows I'm done with the function. Uh, you know, I'm done with this variable. I can move out of it. Um, so by the way, implicit move, also, like copy elision, that is a special case. It is observable. It is an observable optimization. That's why the standard has to talk about it. Um, here I have a struct widget containing a string data member. In my destructor, I print out destroyed and then the, the name, right? Destroyed, whatever name I was constructed with. So if you construct a widget with hello, and then I return that widget, and then at that closing curly brace that you can't see because the uh, settings menu keeps popping up down here, but at this closing curly brace, um, I'm going to destroy my local variable w. And destroying my local variable w calls its destructor, and it prints destroyed w.name, whatever that is. Without implicit move, if this return w copy constructed uh, into the return slot, w.name would have its old value. It would have the value hello, and this would print destroyed hello. But in C++ uh, 11 and later, what we will actually see is that w got moved out of, and the, the uh, implicitly generated defaulted move constructor moved out of each of its members. So name is now in a moved from state, and I am see outing destroyed, you know, in practice, empty string. Um, some valid but unspecified value that the string has because it's now been moved from. Um, so how is this OK? Uh, right, it changes the behavior of my program. Well, it doesn't really change the behavior of your program. Your program has this behavior. right? Um, and part of writing good C++ code is to uh, not write terribly pathological code that depends on things like uh, you know, reading your members in the destructor when your members might be in a moved from state. Um, right? So this is considered to be pathological code that we don't need to worry about breaking. Um, uh, and the benefit that we get by breaking this code is uh, that code becomes much more efficient, right? I'm now not making a copy of a std string just in case its destructor does something weird. I can actually move out of it. And that's much more efficient. Right? No memory allocation, et cetera. Um, I'm going to take another little pause here and look at the live comments. Uh, this would be a good time to ask questions if you have any. All right. Uh, moving on. So this is a special case, right? We, we've decided that it's OK to break these pathological types like widget uh, in order to get very good uh, code gen, non-copying code gen on return x. Or even if we can't get copy elision, we can at least do a move instead of a copy. Um, but now what if I had something like this, return two upper of s. Um, this is the last use of s in the function. Uh, maybe I should move from s into two upper. Right? Um, well, you could imagine a world in which we did something like that. But that gets very fiddly very fast. And no one has ever come up with good um, essentially heuristics right? for for figuring out when we should move and when we shouldn't. It, um, if, if we're not going to go all the way to like uh, lifetime analysis like Rust, 
um, it becomes very fiddly to decide, well, okay, we should move from S in this case, since it's the only parameter to two upper. But if I have a append of S comma S, then can I turn both of those into R values? Well, no, because right, I, I need to make two copies and put them next to each other. Can I turn just the second one into an R value, just the first one? We don't know unless we know what the function does. Um, so we have implicit moves in return x when we're returning x just by name, uh, because that is super useful. Um, but we conservatively limit it to only that exact construct, and we avoid uh, making special rules for any complicated cases. Um, so keep it simple. The simple thing is return x is special. Return x, returning a local variable by name, can do copulation. And if it can't do copulation, then it can do implicit move. Right? Return x is special. Everything else is not special. Returns did move of x is not special. Return append of s is not special. All right, so that was a simple thing, but you guys want the truth. That's why you came here. So let me talk about some more stories. I'm going to do two stories. We're going to start with this one. This is the one that really got me interested in, in the stuff back in like January 2018. Um, so we have this code base. And this code base has um, a bunch of C code. This is a, this is a very old code base. So it, of course, it was all written in C. And we've got all of these uh, C functions that, that create these C expression tree sort of things um, using malloc, right? There's a function called sex per new int. You pass it an int, it malloc space for a struct sex per um, with a sex per kind int, and, and it puts the int in there, and it returns you a pointer to that allocated memory. Uh, you can then use that. You can create uh, other like trees you know, using uh, uh, sex per list append, which is now, again, below my settings menu here. Um, and then when you're done with a sex per, you call uh, sex per free right, to free that memory. Um, there's also a clone method that's like a copy constructor in C++. This is a very common pattern for C libraries, is to basically do everything you would do in C++, just do it all with pointers on the heap. But here we have constructors, we have a copy constructor, and we have a destructor, essentially, in C. Um, but this was the old code base. We've decided that we're going to do everything in C++ from now on, and so we're going to write a C++ wrapper around our C API. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to, we're going to have a uh, an RAII class, CXPR, uh, it holds a pointer to a lowercase CXPR. Uh, that's the C version, right? Um, you can have it take ownership of a CXPR star. Uh, and then it has a copy constructor that calls CXPR clone. It has a move constructor that moves uh, the pointer and nulls out the pointer on the right hand side. And we have a destructor that calls CXPR free, okay? assuming that CXPR free does nothing for a null pointer. Uh, so that's our generic expression tree um, processor. And then uh, we can actually add some type safety. If I'm working only with ints, I can say, OK, I will have a subclass, a uh, drive class here. CXPR int is a CXPR, um, but it adds these extra uh, convenience methods like int value const that just calls CXPR int value. Um, and I know that whenever I'm working strictly with ints, uh, I can use the CXPR int class. When I'm working strictly with strings, I use CXPR string and so on. So these are all derived from that base class that can represent any kind of CXPR at all. Um, and this is nice because then if I have a function that takes a reference to a CXPR, I can pass it a CXPR int. A CXPR int is a CXPR. Everything works fine. Here's my CXPR list right, with some convenience methods, length and append. Um, you can look at the slides later for that. And then we have some C++ functions that return an owning uh, CXPR. Um, right? CXPR is an RAI type. We pass it around by value. Um, so here's my uh, serialized function for a business object. Um, it uh, creates a CXPR list, appends some items to it, and then returns that CXPR list. It's big red arrow, big red arrow time. So we give our code to QA, and QA determines that sometimes it runs really slow. And the reason it runs really slow is that we are spending an awful lot of cycles cloning these CXPR objects, um, specifically on that last line, return CFG. But you told me 
that when I say return X by name, it should do copy elision. Oh, but it can't do copy elision here because we have the uh, durian fruit example here, right? CXPR list is like a durian. It is a CXPR, but more. Now that more is really just extra um, methods, e extra member functions. It doesn't actually add any data, um, but okay. So I have a durian fruit uh, example here, but still you told me return X would treat X as an R value. We do implicit move. Why is it doing the copy constructor? Why isn't it doing a move construct here, which would be very efficient? Why is it calling the copy constructor that has to call clone? Well, let me tell you the truth. The truth is actual rules of implicit move uh, were amended uh, circa 2014. Um, but basically they, they say, uh, if the expression in a return statement is an ID expression naming an object with automatic storage duration, blah, 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 um, overload resolution to select the constructor for the copy is first performed as if the object were designated by an R value. Okay, good. That's what I wanted. That sounds good. If the first overload resolution as an R value fails or was not performed, or if the type of the first parameter of the selected constructor is not an R value reference to the object's type, overload resolution is performed again considering the object as an, as an L value. So what went wrong here is slicing. The constructor we wanted to call here was the move constructor of CXPR. Um, but what we got when we did this overload resolution for CFG as a R value reference to a CXPR list, the constructor that we found was in fact uh, the constructor of CXPR that takes a CXPR ref ref, right? an R value reference to a CXPR. But CFG's type is CXPR list, right? So the first parameter of the selected constructor was not an R value reference to the object's type CXPR list. So our slicing here, we intended to slice. Um, it was 100% intentional, but it still silently disabled the implicit move optimization that we thought we were going to get. And what we got instead was a copy. It was a copy construct, which is very expensive in this case. Uh, before we go on to the second one, I, I'm just going to peek one more time at the live questions. I see that people are asking questions and having them answered by other people, which is cool. Um, I don't immediately see any questions for me, so I'm going to keep going on. And if there are any uh, moderators, please paste them over into private chat. Um, all right. Let's do another war story here. In place function. This is a. Uh, Pretty cool thing, actually. It's a non-allocating version of std function uh, maintained uh, mainly by me in the SG14 uh, GitHub repository. Um, there was also a standard proposal for it a while back, but I, I think that went away or something, got abandoned. Um, so in place function looks like this. Uh, it has two constructors here. And one of them is a copy constructor, and one of them is a move constructor. But actually, you can construct any uh, in place function um, from any other in place function with the same signature uh, that has a capacity which is not greater than my capacity. Um, so I, I write these two converting constructors that says, uh, I know how to construct myself from RHS, from the source type. Um, and if RHS is an R value reference, I know how to steal his guts and, and use them for me. Um, maintainer suggested that uh, it would be easier to reason about if we rewrote these as conversion operators. A conversion operator says, I know how to convert myself to the other guy's type, to the return type. Um, and if I am an R value, right, I can have an R value ref qualified version of this conversion operator. If I'm an R value, I can lend him my guts. Um, so uh, let's rewrite it like this. this. This matches our mental model a little bit better. It doesn't require reaching into some other guy, RHS, and disemboweling him. Uh, it allows me to disembowel myself and hand my guts to somebody else, which is sort of nicer if you think about it. So this matches our mental model a bit better. But when we do this, uh, we have a big red arrow in our source code again. We find that uh, if I have a function get upstream callback that returns an in-place function uh, with a capacity of 32 bytes. Um, and I call that, 
here in uh, Config Manager Impl callback, maybe with some caller. Um, I say get upstream callback. So that is an IPF32. And now I'm going to try to implicitly convert that to an IPF64 and return it. Uh, this had worked before. Uh, it would do the lookup with uh, result as an R value. It would find that converting instructor and it would use it. But as soon as I changed it to a conversion operator, this suddenly started spending a lot of time in std strings copy constructor copying this member of the Lambda um, because it was copying the function. Why was it copying the function? Well, if the first overload resolution fails or is not performed, or if the type of the first parameter of the selected constructor is not an R value reference to the object's type. And in this case, we did not have a selected constructor. What we had was a selected conversion operator. Right? And so this didn't work. Overload resolution was performed again, considering the object as an L value. So, so it doesn't work when you have conversion operators. So why then are constructors so important uh, to the C++ standard? Why did they put in all that wording with such emphasis on finding constructors that take R value references to exact class types. What's so important about this particular special case, they decided to make it into the standard and uh, even as a defect res uh, resolution. Um, so the same rule was actually inserted into C++11 after C++11 had technically shipped. Um, the reason is unique pointer. If I have a function create that says I return a unique pointer to a widget and I make a local variable P uh, where I say, okay, you know, make me uh, a unique putter, and then I return it here. I can't just say return p unless this line would implicitly move, right? If this line did a copy, I wouldn't be able to write it here because unique putter is not copyable. So that was the reason that they had to add it was basically so that unique putter would work in, in return p, and of course. Even before this resolution, I could have said return std move of p, but then that would have disabled copy elision. I really want copy elision to work. So all of these features end up have, having to work together. Right? We want to encourage people to write return p, but therefore we need implicit move so that they can write return p for things like unique pointer. Um, and that's going to be true as, as we go forward in C++ 2023. We want to encourage people to write return p. Um, if there are cases such as we saw in the previous two war stories where return p did the wrong thing, uh, we would actually like to fix those. Right? Anytime return p does something bad and I have to write something different to get the effect I want, um, that's bad. And, and the standard should change to, to permit us to write simple code in more cases. So the standard library, the STL, really loves move-enabled converting constructors. Right, the SDL is all about constructors, and in particular, it's all about converting constructors. So we have a converting constructor that can convert a unique putter of U to a unique putter of T, uh, or create a uh, optional T out of a T, or a variant out of a T, uh, or a, func a std function out of a T. And these are all implemented as converting constructors that take R value references. Um, so because the STL does everything this way, uh, when they inserted this defect resolution into C++11, they didn't really think about all of the other ways that you might get an implicit conversion in C++, such as slicing to a base class, converting operators, uh, combinations of the both. Um, and so they just put in this one special case, makes unique putter work, that's great. Um, but they missed all these other cases where writing return x actually got you a copy, whereas writing std move of x would have gotten you a move. So can we get the compiler to warn us when we write return x, but return std move of x would have been more efficient? Um, Clang has pretty much always, a, a very long time, maybe 2015, maybe longer, has had this thing called uh, w pessimizing move. This is enabled with w all, um, and it will look for places where you wrote return std move, and it will tell you to remove the call to std move. And it will do this exactly in the cases where the compiler knows it wants to do copy elision, but you're preventing it by writing something that is not returning by name. So it says, please remove this did move in the parentheses. Um, that will allow me to do copy elision. Um, however, these cases that we had had uh, in these war stories, the corner cases were the opposite. The problem there was I wrote return X when I should have written return did move of X. So Clang did not have a warning for that sneakier case. And so in 2018, um, I went and added one. 
So now when you run Clang W all, uh, you get this other option, uh, this, this other warning that says local variable CFG will be copied despite being returned by name, right? Not just moved out of, but actually we'll call the copy constructor um, because it's in one of these corner cases that is not covered by the current C++ 17 wording. Um, and it will invite you to add a call to std move, right? So now we've got both. We've got like, sometimes you need to add a call. Sometimes you need to remove a call. Most of the time you need to remove a call. Our rule of thumb still applies. Um, and the rule of thumb is just write return X. It should just work. The cases where it doesn't work, we should fix those. So Clang starts warning about uh, these things, right? uh, Oh, there's some corner cases in the patch. Like, uh, don't suggest to std move trivial types because you can't possibly do any better. Um, don't suggest did move if I'm returning like an L value reference, um, because that would just be plain old wrong. All right. Um, and I just have one slide here of, of complaining about the structure of Clang. Um, the way this patch works essentially, um, and the way W pessimizing move works essentially is, um, do overload resolution one way using the real rules, do overload resolution using hypothetical future rules that are better, uh, and then compare the two results. And if they differ, that's when you say, hey, you know, if, you know, if the standard let us, we would, we would compile your code this way, but you know, you, it didn't work. Um, so this is a very powerful technique. Compile it the right way, compile it the hypothetical fantasy way, compare the two. Um, Clang's architecture makes this a real pain to implement because it tangles up, you know, sort of doing a lookup with emitting diagnostics or checking whether transformation is possible with actually doing the transformation. It's got a lot of mutable state. Um, it's generally very hard to do things using this, this architecture in Clang where we do things one way and another way and compare them. Um, I think that it would be, uh, great if, uh, Clang, uh, worked on you know, making things more functional, making it easier to do this for, for all sorts of places in the compiler. Um, there is a, a question from the, the comments here. Uh, is there actually two questions? Uh, start with the first one. Can the compiler distinguish the cases where the slicing matters? Like there are no additional data members, but still optimized despite the slicing. Um, uh, if I understand the question correctly, you're saying, is there a place where I'm returning a CXPR list as a CXPR and the compiler can detect that, well, they're the same size, so I'm just gonna go ahead and, and do copy elision there or something like that. Um, that is That seems to be what's happening with that virtual base version um, in every compiler except Clang. Uh, and I'm not sure whether that's a bug or not. In this case, uh, with a named return value optimization, that would not be permitted according to the standard, um, but could they go ahead and do it anyway? I'm, I, sure, we're gonna see there's a lot of implementation divergence in this area, um, but I'm not aware that any compilers do that in practice and they are not technically allowed to either. Uh, and is there a way to force the compiler to treat a sexper list like a sexper? Um, I'm not sure what the point of the question is, unless it's a duplicate of the previous one, where you're saying I have a sex per list variable, but I want to pretend that it's a sex per for the purpose of copy elision. Again, no, technically you can't do that. In practice, no compilers do do that. Could you do it? Sure. Um, all right. So that was pretty much where my talk ended uh, at CPPCon, but there have been some developments since then. Um, so, at the San Diego meeting, David Stone, who's been very active in this area too, and is much more active on the committee than I am, he's, he's got some great proposals. Um, he presented two different proposals in San Diego. One of them was a paper written by me uh, called More Implicit Moves, which goes through the examples we've seen in this talk and says, I would like the compiler to optimize these as well to use implicit move. Um, and he was actually working in parallel on uh, PO527 to implicitly move from our value references. Um, we'll see some examples of that soon. Um, and these papers were both adopted thanks to his shepherding them through. Um, you can see the formal wording in this other paper that combines both wordings. Um, so C++ 20 will have fixed on paper, at least will have fixed the two examples that we just saw the two war stories. 
So C++ 20 introduces this idea of an implicitly movable entity. An implicitly movable entity is uh, a variable that is eligible for copy elision um, or an R value reference, um, which isn't volatile. Never use volatile, right? Um, if you return an implicitly movable entity by name, that is, you say, return x uh, in a copy initializ uh, initialization context, this causes overload resolution to treat the entity as an R value when possible. So um, in this code snippet below, all of the highlighted variables here are implicitly movable entities. Uh, P and C and D and I are all implicitly movable because they are variables of automatic storage duration. Um, they're, they're actual like objects on the stack in the under the control of function. Um, PRR and LRR are also um, uh, implicitly movable entities because they are our value references to fruits. Um, so if I were to say return P or return PRR or return C or return LRR or return D or return I, all of those things um, will then treat that entity as an R value if possible. And in many of these cases, that's a change from how it worked in C++ 11. Um, let's see some examples of uh, the kinds of corner cases addressed by these papers um, and how C++ 20 is going to change the behavior. So here uh, in five, uh, I create a widget and then I throw it. Copy elision is technically permitted here, but nobody does it. Um, that is not surprising. I don't think anyone will ever do it. Um, but this is an implicit move. Everyone will will say, oh, OK, I'm, I allocate the thrown widget object on the stack in, in some exception object boilerplate. And then I will move construct from W into that, um, into that space. Um, so implicit move happens there. Uh, similarly here, if I'm returning out of a parameter, that's an implicit move. It can't be copy elided because of physics, um, but it does an implicit move. Um, and if I throw a parameter, uh, interestingly, uh, that was supposed to be a plain old copy in C++17 um, due to loopholes in the formal wording. It was supposed to copy. However, everybody except for GCC already did implicit move there. So that was some implementation divergence, which we fixed in C++20 by saying, yes, we also do implicit move in that case. Uh, so hopefully soon, you know, within the next three years, GCC will catch up to where the other compilers are today, because now it is formally mandated that they do so. Uh, eight and nine here are examples. Uh, this is basically my uh, in-place function example. Um, so I have a uh, struct from that has converting constructors. I have construct to that has conversion operators. Uh, so in both cases, the conversion goes, I have a widget and I want to make a from, or I, I'm, yes, I have a widget and I want to make a from, or uh, I have a to and I want to make a widget. So uh, in this first case, return W, that must do implicit move. It, it treats W as an R value, looks it up, finds a constructor, does implicit move. Uh, in the second case, nine, um, return T, treats T as an R value, uh, does overload resolution, finds something that is not a constructor. Um, and therefore in C++ 17 and earlier, this would be a plain old copy. It would not consider that to be a candidate. It would do, redo the overload resolution as an L value. Um, GCC actually uh, would have already done an implicit move in that case. Um, C++ 20 makes this case work, uh, says, hey, Clang, MSVC, ICC, you guys need to catch up to where GCC is today. Um, example three here, uh, this one due to Barry Revzen. Um, if I have a uh, fish. I'm oh, sorry, this says from, it should say fish. Um, fish has two constructors, uh, one of which takes an L value widget, the other takes an R value widget. Uh, 10 uh, implicitly moves from W. It does the lookup as an R value, finds the fish constructor here, um, and uses it. Uh, however, if that constructor were a, a by value sync, if it took a widget object itself, 
then overload resolution treating w as an r value would find a constructor for foul um, which whose parameter was not an r value reference to a widget it was an actual widget object and therefore um, it would not trigger the wording for implicit move in 17. In 20, we've fixed that loophole. So GCC would already do an implicit move in this case. We're saying, hey, everyone, catch up to where GCC is today. Uh, another example, um, if I have a unique pointer to a derived object, and then I am converting that to a unique pointer to base, uh, this works fine and it will do an implicit move. It has to to make unique pointer work. However, if I remove the pointers and I just do value semantics, I have a derived return a base, uh, this will not do a, uh, this is the slicing example. This is the, uh, the CX for list example, the durian example. Um, I can't do copy elision. Uh, I would like to do implicit move. C++20 makes this an implicit move. Does everyone else catch up to where GCC is? Uh, another example. Uh, if I have a parameter of R value reference type and I return it. Now this is interesting uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in the moment, but this is, this is David Stone's contribution to the, uh, the proposal. Right? This is David Stone's proposal that if I have an R value reference in C++20 uh, and I return it and I return a new widget object made from that R value reference, Normally, this is a named thing. This is W, uh, so this is an L value. But in a return statement, return W is special. Uh, this will be treated as an R value. I'll get implicit move. I will call the move constructor and move construct a widget from whatever W refers to. This is new in C++20. C++17 did not do this. I was pretty happy with C++17 not doing this. David Stone says, no, we should do this. Um, and I, I'm coming around to it. Uh, similarly, if I have W uh, taken by reference here, but then I say, okay, give me an R value reference to W, right? So just take W and convert it to an R value reference and then return that R value reference. This will then essentially do the same thing as return std move of W or return std move of X. Um, so C++ 20 makes returning from an R value reference do something cool. Finally, there's one more case, uh, which I proposed in uh, Kona, I think, uh, most recently um, in the same paper, that it is very common to see people write uh, overloaded operators. Like if I'm writing a, uh, an increment operator or a plus operator where I say return w plus equals one, um, you and I know that what this does is add one to W and then return W. So these two versions of the code, 16 and 17, should produce the same uh, code gen, right? Because they both add one to W and then return W. But it turns out that in this case, because I say return just W by name, uh, that triggers implicit move. And I move construct from W uh, into the return slot. Uh, in 17, though, uh, the thing being returned here is actually the widget ref that is returned by operator plus equals. And the compiler does not pretend to have any special knowledge about what that ref refers to. Um, it just says, okay, I get back a reference to some widget, and then I need to return a copy of that widget, so I call the copy constructor. Right? It, it is not going to uh, move out of that uh, that. Uh, widget W. Um, so I suggested a special case for this, uh, but that was turned down in Kona, um, pro probably wisely, um, because again, this is not a uh, um, a simple case. This is not return W semicolon. This is return some compound expression, and just because it has happens to contain uh, an assignment operator, an increment operator, doesn't necessarily mean that we should optimize it. So if you're in the habit of writing um, heavy, expensive to copy classes with overloaded operators that, that have one-liners like this, um, I strongly advise you to write them as two-liners so that you get the benefit of copy elision or, or of implicit move, rather. Uh, so one caveat here, um, this talk is all about caveats. So even the solutions to our earlier caveats have themselves caveats. 
Um, oh, we have a question, I think, on this previous slide. So maybe I'll take that before we go on. Um, let me look at the. Hello, I don't know what the question is. And with widget refref operator plus equals int i refref qualified. Uh, what about it? Um, oh, if that were the definition of plus equals, if so, if operator plus equals returned an R value reference to this, um, then we would move out of it. Wait. No, we still would not move out of it. Uh, we would move out of it, but not because of implicit move. Because in that case, you would have you wouldn't have a name for the thing at all. It would be the result of a function call, um, and so it would still be an R value, and we would just do that would just be ordinary overload resolution. Um, however, in practice, you would never have an operator plus equals that returns a widget ref ref. I mean, I can't. Well, you did R value. Yeah, don't do that though. <laughs> that just seems messy. Um, we also have, is there any difference between return x and return x with parens around it? Um, no, not that I know of. Uh, the, the rules are specifically written, all the rules I've talked about so far, um, all the rules I know of uh, treat x with parens exactly the same as x without parens. Uh, if there is some difference, uh, then I don't know it. But there are differences in some places, like, like decal type, right? Decal type of x versus decal type of parens x is, is going to be different. Um, but yeah, um, yeah. If you have a function that returns decal type auto, uh, there might be a difference between return x and return parens x. I don't actually know if that is the case or not. But yeah, if you're using decal type or decal type auto, I would I would watch out. But there is no difference in terms of implicit move. There is no difference in terms of copy elision. All right. So caveats to the caveats. Um, Oh yeah, someone asks, uh, is it true that uh, copy is more expensive than implicit move is more expensive than copy elision? Uh, yeah, I mean, that that is the point. Um, so we wanna try to get copy elision if we can. If we can't, we'll get implicit move. If we can't, we'll get copy, ideally. All right, so caveat. Um, returning an implicitly movable entity by name in a copy initialization context causes overload resolution to treat the entity as an R value. Um, it will do that consistently, 100% of the time, it will treat it as an R value, but that doesn't say anything about CV qualification. If I have a durian here declared as const, const durian CD, return CD, CD's type is const durian, or it's an L value const durian, it will be treated as an R value. We will, we will look it up as if it were the R value of type const durian ref ref, an R value reference to a const durian. But it's still const. We still can't use the move constructor uh, if you declare the local variable const. Right? Const means I never change, not even to pilfer my value uh, and move out of me. Right? So uh, this would be a candidate for copy elision, if possible. Right? Copy elision doesn't care about const because we're never actually mutating the object. We're just, just deciding where to allocate its space. But we're not going to do any extra modification of it. But const on a local variable will still continue to disable implicit move in practice, right? It finds that same copy constructor that we would have found in the L value case. We don't find the move constructor because the move constructor takes an R value reference to a non-const object. So this is a, a good reason to not sprinkle const on your local variables um, as a general rule, right? Or at least be, be selective in the cases where you're trying to trigger copy elision or trying to trigger implicit move particularly. Um, also in C++ 20, C++ 20, one of the flagship features is coroutines, which adds three new keywords, uh, co-return, co-await, and co-yield. Uh, two of those, co-return and co-yield, are ways of sort of producing values out of a function, out of a caller to the callee. Um, and so you might ask, well, does this stuff, does copy elision and does implicit move apply also to those? Um, so everything that applies to return x will also apply to throw x and also to co-return x. 
So there are three ways to get a value actually out of a function and stop that function from running, right? To, to end the execution of that function and leave it forever. Return, throw, co-return. Co um, so return and co-return will work exactly the same way. However, you're never going to get copy elision on co-return. You will get the uh, uh, guaranteed copy elision, the deferred PR value uh, materialization. Um, for temporary materialization, you'll get it for PR values um, just automatically as of C17. Um, but you will never get named return value optimization. You'll never get that kind of, uh, of copy elision on co return X. The best you can hope for is implicit move, and you will get implicit move. X may be implicitly moved into the, the return value function. Uh, so co return X is always the final use of X. Co-yield, on the other hand, sadly is not, right? You might think of co-yield as being like, okay, you know, return one, then return two, then return three. You know, I have this generator that, that yields these values. And so in each case, I would like uh, co-yield X to implicitly move out of X because I'm sort of, you know, I'm sort of done with it here, right? Each time through this loop, I create a string S and then I yield it. I create a string S and then I yield it. This will call the copy constructor. This will not call the move constructor of string. This will not make an implicit move because the compiler does not know at this point whether you're really done with S or not, right? It doesn't look to see that S is declared in this very small scope. S could be declared outside the scope of the for loop. And then you could use the old value of S again when you returned and resumed that coroutine. Um, so co-yield does not do implicit move. Co-return does, um, but it's used very rarely, is my impression. Co-yield, which you're going to use a lot with generators, if you want it to move out of a local variable, you still need to use std move here. Um, I am fairly confident compilers do not warn about this yet because you know they're still working on the implementation of coroutines. Uh, I expect and hope that uh, they will get better at, at static analyzing this sort of thing and saying, hey, you know, it looks like S is dead after this point. You could still move out of it if you wanted to. Um, in fact, we just had a question. Could co-yield do implicit move? And the answer is no. Um, will it ever be allowed to do implicit move? Um, I cannot immediately think of how it could be allowed. Um, but there are papers coming for C++ 23, which uh, show that there's still work to be done in this area. So it's, it's possible we might one day get implicit move for some kinds of co-yield. Certainly not every co-yield, right? Because it's certainly possible to co-yield i and then go around the loop again and, and increment i and, and co-yield i again, right? You, um, so there are cases where you do need to preserve the value with co-yield. Um, there are also some wrinkles around throw, which I hadn't uh, fully internalized at the time. Um, I said that there were three ways of permanently exiting a function, return, co-return, and throw. It turns out uh, throw doesn't always permanently exit the function, right? The syntactic form throw s here, when I say throw s, um, that exception is actually going to get caught in this catch block. And in this catch block, I could actually use local variable s, right? s is still in scope in this catch block. Therefore, this throw s will not implicitly move. It must make a copy. It is guaranteed to make a copy. Uh, the only throw that is um, a candidate for implicit move here is this second throw S. It's a candidate for implicit move because there is no larger catch block, right? It's not inside a, sorry, it's not inside a try. Um, a throw inside a try might end up getting caught in that catch and then we could use that variable again. Um, but this last throw here definitely leaves the potential scope of S. Uh, therefore, S is def this is definitely the last use of S. Therefore, we can implicitly move out of it. This local limited form of static analysis is reflected in the wording, the formal wording for throw. Um, implicit move is guaranteed here, um, at least on paper. You know, I, I don't know if there's implementation divergence in this particular area because I didn't test, but I don't think there is. Um, there are some changes here uh, in David Stone's paper, um, but they're just sort of Im cosmetic improvements to the wording, uh, cleaning up the wording. They're, they're not changing the fundamental behavior of throw. 
there are some pathological cases um, in uh, C++ 20, some pathological code that we are continuing to break pathological code in order to produce better code gen for the 99.999% of people. Um, here's an example uh, due to Jason Merrill of, of let's say Red Hat. Um, struct S uh, has two constructors. It has a copy constructor that takes a const S ref, uh, const X ref like we're all used to. And then it has another copy constructor that takes a non-const ref. Um, so in C++ 17, uh, return X would have looked up uh, X as an R value, and it would have found uh, this const X ref constructor, uh, which does not take an R value reference parameter as its first parameter. Therefore, uh, the selected constructor didn't have the proper form, and C++ 17 would fall back to treating X as an L value, which it would then look up and find the, uh, the number one constructor. In C++ 20, R value lookup will succeed. It has fewer constraints on what it's looking for. It's not looking for a constructor that takes an R value ref. It's just looking for overload resolution to succeed. Um, overload resolution will succeed, and it will find constructor number two. So here, return X is actually going to find, uh, interestingly enough, right? it finds the constructor that is definitely a worse match for the type of X. Um, Right? X is literally a, an L value X that is non-const. If you called a function, you know, if these were function F, you would definitely find number one. But in C++ 20, we're going to treat it as an R value. We're going to find number two. And we're going to do that because that solves all of these other corner cases that I just spent uh, 90 minutes talking about. Um, even if you write this particular pathological code, uh, you get uh, different results. That's fine. Nobody should be writing this. Right? This isn't even auto putter. This is more pathological than auto putter because this has both a, a copy constructor and, and a copy constructor. Um, so the world shaking change uh, introduced by David Stone in C++ 20 is that we're going to move out of automatic variables of R value reference type. If I have a parameter here of uh, R value reference type and I say return S, in C++ 17 it would say, okay, you're referring to this variable referred to by s, this object referred to by s, uh, I don't know who else might refer to this object. Um, I don't know if you're going to want to use it again. You have a name for it, which is s. You could totally use s after this point, maybe in a destructor. So uh, I am going to play it safe, and I'm going to make a copy. In C++20, though, this says I'm not playing it safe any longer. I'm going to implicitly move out of it because you're returning a thing that you have an R value reference to. You have an R value reference to this thing. This is the last use of even that R value reference. Um, I'm going to, to move out of that object. So just like returns did move of S in C17. Um, so uh, in this case, I have a move only object, a unique putter. I have an R value reference to a unique putter, and I'm saying return P in C17. This would not compile. This would give me an error because it would be trying to copy the uh, thing referred to by P, uh, and you can't copy a unique putter. In C++20, this will compile just fine, and it will move out of P. Should you ever write this code? No, I don't think you should. Um, will it work? Yes. It is observably different behavior in C++20 versus C++17. This is new in C++20. Again, this is all on paper. I'm not aware that any compiler has implemented this behavior yet. But to be a conforming C++20 compiler, you must implement this behavior at some point. Um, so this improves uh, some uses of decal type auto. Uh, if I have a function g, what I'm going to do is create widget, create a, a w widget, and then I'm going to move out of that widget. I'm going to, by, by tagging the object with std move, I'm saying I'm done with it. This is the last use of w. Feel free to pilfer its guts if they will help you. And now that it's been so tagged, I'm going to call its get name method. And whatever that gives me, I'm going to put it in a variable name, and I'm going to return name. So returning by name here. So this is going to trigger copy elision when it can, implicit move otherwise, copy uh, otherwise. And then I have three different possible signatures for get name here. Oh, well, I, should, I said name. I should have said get name. Um, so if get name returns by value, then uh, 
get name itself presumably will make a, a copy or a, or maybe a move or or something. I said in this case it must make a copy. But as far as I'm concerned, as far as, as far as the caller's code is concerned, um, I give it a return slot that is exactly name, which is exactly my return slot, and I get copy elision all the way down the line. If get name returns a const string ref, this is the most common accessor, right? If you're writing your own class, this is a very familiar signature for an accessor. Um, it doesn't care about the ref qualification of the this uh, object w. It just says, I give you back a const string ref. Uh, name then is a const string ref. And here, where I return name, that's going to call the copy constructor of string, copying from w's name member into my return slot. However, if I provide an R value qualified uh, uh, accessor that returns an R value ref, this is where the behavior changes in C17 to 20. In 17, this would also have, uh, let's see, in this case, name would be a string ref ref, and I say return name, and it says, okay, you're returning an L value, name is an L value of R value ref type, but you, you have a name for it, it's name. Um, so call the copy constructor. Uh, in C++20, because name is a local variable of type string ref ref, we will actually call the move constructor and move out of W's name. Um, and so code gen gets a little bit better for this one case. Is this the proper way to write a uh, ref qualified accessor? Um, personally, I don't think so. I think it should just return by value, in which case there's not going to be a difference. Um, but um, I don't know. At least if you write this, your code quietly gets better. Uh, that's our goal every time we're, we're messing around with copy elision and implicit move. We're trying to take the code you write today, the very simple looking code. Yeah, it's decal type auto. It's not simple, but return name looks simple. We want to make it as fast as we possibly can. Uh, you know. So C20 will have a perfect returning idiom using decal type auto, similar to what was on the previous slide. We have perfect forwarding, right? In C++ uh, 11, in C++ 20, we finally have perfect returning. What I mean by that is uh, here I have a function that takes some number of args and perfectly forwards them on to this f that is also passed in. And f's result, yeah, and we can do whatever we want with, with the args beforehand, right? I'm passing them to f, but before I do that, I can call their pre-observe method on every single args. Um, but then I take that result. And I can post observe that result and then return it from this function. And in C17, this would fail to compile for uh, R value references returned from F um, because return result would uh, say I'm returning an L value, uh, not an R value. Uh, in C20, this will compile no matter what the return type of F is. Right? If it's a PR value object, this will compile and do copy elision. If it's an L value reference, this will compile and return an L value reference. If it's an R value reference, this will compile and return an R value reference. Um, so this is the perfect returning idiom. Uh, again, uh, from my discussions with committee members, it appears that this is intentional and that this should work uh, and that they believe that they interpret the standards paper wording to say that it does work. Um, on paper. No compiler implements any of this yet, but to be conforming in C20, they will have to implement it. Um, commenter there asks, uh, when did we get ref qualifiers? Uh, yeah, that was C11. Uh, they're, they're obscure, um, but just like you can have CV qualifiers on, on the end, you can have ref qualifiers as well. You can have L value or R value uh, ref qualifiers there. Um, Someone asks, so on the, uh, the get name example, does that mean that every time I write a, uh, a, a getter that looks like this, should I also write a getter that is uh, R value ref qualified that looks like this? Um, no, I mean, generally, no. Uh, only you know uh, how your code is intended to be used, what patterns of use you expect. Um, one place that a signature like this did get added was on uh, O string stream. Right, O string stream, and it's extremely common to put a bunch of things into an O string string stream and then call stir on it. And stir normally gives you a copy of the buffer. Um, but in the case that this is the last use of the string stream, I can say move of my string stream dot stir. Uh, 
And that will call the R value ref qualified version of STIR that actually moves out the buffer uh, and does not require a memory allocation at that point. Um, so that's an example of a class, O string stream, where the designer knew that that was a common pattern. And so they added a ref qualified accessor for STIR. Um, but uh, only you know if your class is, is more like string stream or more like you know, something that, that didn't go to all that trouble. It's extra trouble, right? It's a trade off. Write more code, get some benefit out of it. Don't, don't pay the cost unless you get a benefit. Um, so we are, we are almost done, I promise. And this totally didn't take 60 minutes. Um, guaranteed named return value optimization in C23. Uh, there is a proposal. Um, proposed a post C++20 for C++23, already pronounced tentatively ready, as in like we could just put this in as soon as we start taking features for C++23, uh, called Guaranteed Copulation for Named Return Objects. And it essentially says, here is what compilers could do uh, with copulation. Right, copulation right now for named return objects, like here we say return B or return A or return C, all of these are places that copulation is permitted but not required in C17 and 20. Right? All the changes in 20 were about implicit move. There was no change about copulation. In 23, we're looking at changes to copulation to say, let's formally specify the perfect compiler algorithm. Um, that could figure out things like, OK, here in return B, I could copulate this. I could allocate B directly into the return slot. That wouldn't be a problem. Here, uh, return C, I could put C in the return slot. That wouldn't be a problem. And in fact, I could do both of those simultaneously, right? because I only enter this code and construct B if I'm going to return it. Um, and I only enter this code and construct C if I'm going to return it. Um, Right. Yes, because I can construct B in the return slot, and then either I return it or I destroy it, at which point I'm ready to put something else in that return slot. So uh, I can definitely do copulation for both B and C, whereas I cannot do copulation for A uh, consistently. Um, this proposal formalizes that human logic I just went through and says, let's just mandate that every compiler implement copulation in this way. Um, so we say that B and C are named return objects. And as named return objects, it is guaranteed that you get copulation uh, when you return them by name. Um, this is something that is permitted under um, C++ you know, 98. But in C++ 23, it might finally be guaranteed. Um, now, this is uh, non-trivial, because uh, today, uh, Clang will actually do copulation here. If you take this code and paste it into Compiler Explorer, you will see that Clang allocates B in the return slot and does not call a move constructor or a copy constructor on this line. Um, however, here, it will do a move construct. And as for GCC, ICC, and I think MSVC, uh, all of them will, uh, will call the move constructor for C. Um, so nobody today is as good as P2025 proposal uh, asks them to be. So if, if it is accepted for C++23, then a conforming C++23 compiler will do copulation in vastly more cases um, than even the best compiler does today uh, by, uh, by choice. Right? It will no longer be a choice. You will have to not only be as good as the best compiler today, you will have to be even better. Um, and that's nice. It might take them you know, five years to get there, but it'll, it'll be interesting. Um, and also, by the way, a little caveat in the purple box here that uh, guaranteed named return optimization, of course, only means when copulation is possible. In particular, it does not mean uh, that it will be copulation for non-trivial, or, or sorry, for trivial class types that are trivially copyable, because those are, tend to be returned in registers. So there we don't have copulation at all. It's not meaningful. Um, so the formal wording had to have a few tweaks to deal with that fact. Right? That's a physical fact we cannot get around. And with that, I am officially at the end of the talk. Thank you all for sticking around uh, to, to hear all of that. And uh, 
Uh, Andres, you can jump back in and say what happens next. I'm fine with taking questions, or we could just go to the Hangout, and people could ask questions there or whatever. Um, yeah, so uh, we had a, a couple of questions uh, queued up that uh, we, we didn't address yet. Um, I would say we, we could maybe um, answer um, like four or five questions, and then um, for, for the rest, we, we just uh, go to the Hangout so that we don't keep people too long um, in the in the stream. Um, so I don't know if, if you if you saw on the on the private uh, chat um, there were a few questions before the last one that you answered which we skipped over now. Yeah, I got the some of those there. Let's see what else we got. Um, uh, um, so think like did, did we did we talk about structured bindings? Did we talk about structured bindings? Uh, no. Um, does RVO trigger on structured bindings? Um, formally, that's I, I see it's Klaus asking that. So, well, no, it's not. Someone in the chat, Klaus is forwarding it. Uh, so, so I probably don't need to be too uh, pedantic. Uh, I'm pretty sure that it does apply. Uh, that is, if I have a structured binding, auto bracket x y close bracket is assigned something, you know, or initialized with something, um, and I say auto with no refs involved, right? So I'm actually creating this object to be structured bound to. Um, then that will do copulation. And in C17, that will do guaranteed uh, copulation, right? Uh, temporary materialization, deferred temporary materialization. Um, if I am returning something out of a structured binding, right? If I say uh, auto x, y is something, and then I say return x, Right, that's an example of using a return x statement, uh, which looks simple, but no, that is not going to do uh, implicit, even implicit move. Uh, that will make a copy, as far as I know. I haven't actually tested that. It, there may be implementation divergence. It would be interesting to know. Um, but if I'm returning x, where x is a part of a structured binding, then uh, no, that will make a copy. And if I wanted it to move, I would have to ex explicitly std move out of it. Um, and I see there's also a question about uh, function try blocks. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so throw in a function try block could implicitly move because, uh, well, the catch block would still have access to the parameters. So if you say throw of a parameter, it would have to copy the parameter. It wouldn't be able to move out of the parameter. Um, mm -hmm. If you said throw of a local variable, uh, then the catch block would not have access to it. And so that throw could be an implicit move. So yeah, I mean, I, I think the questioner has the right intuition probably. Um, we already talked about accessors, um, additional by value accessors. Uh, and the answer was, yeah, I mean, writing extra code is always a cost. Decide whether you need that cost or not. Me, uh, I'm always fine with just, you know, std string name const, right? It's a getter, it should be const. Return by value is easy because we always return everything by value in C. It's a by value language, you know. Uh, all, all of these caveats are just about, um, you know, optimizing various corner cases, right? Mm -hmm. do, do whatever you need and then benchmark it. And if it's spending too much time making copies, then look for places that you could uh, you could move instead. Um, and then 